Great. So um, I'm Lisa Willett. I uh, just finished my first year teaching at Stanford Law School. And this is a paper that I've been working on with Daniel Hamill, who will be starting this fall at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, and I know some of you have seen me present on our prior collaboration together, in which we were thinking about the array of incentives for innovation, um, the different ways that governments can trans facilitate transfers from consumers to innovators beyond simply IP incentives, and we developed this framework for um, thinking about the policy choice of policymakers choosing between these different mechanisms. But for the most part, when we were thinking about this, it was from the perspective of a single jurisdiction that's um, making this choice. And as everyone in this room is well aware, the jurisdictions are not making this choice completely independently. They exist in the world with uh, a lot of other countries that are making their own um, innovation policy decisions. This is a map of the um, countries that are in the WTO and thus uh, have to comply with the TRIPS agreement. We just heard about how many countries are involved in this. And, and in this next project, Daniel and I are thinking about um, this problem of information production at the global level and, and how that complicates the um, innovation policy choice. And in, in doing on this, we're, we're thinking about the kind of conventional story of why we have coordination on IP. And I think this is laid out pretty nicely in a, a great paper by Suzanne Scotchmer and Jay Leo in 2004, um, where she has, I'm grossly oversimplifying a, a terrific paper, but I, I think there's the three steps of what this conventional story is. So the, the first step is that national governments have efficient incentives to invest relative to what is efficient because of uncompensated externalities abroad. This is the story that well, information is a public good, and so we're going to have, um, if there's not coordination, there'll be rampant free riding, and so individual countries will have an incentive to free ride rather than to um, invest, and that leads to uh, underproduction of information. Um, this is the kind of prisoner's dilemma story we were hearing about at the end of the last talk. And so we want some kind of coordination to avoid this problem. And um, this talk about there's lots of different ways that states can incentivize production of information goods. But uh, IP might seem like the obvious coordination point because we don't have a global public finance system. We can't have some world government that says we're going to have a global tax and everyone has to contribute to some uh, prize fund. So it might seem easiest to say, okay, everyone has to have certain IP laws, and then the consumers in each country will contribute to the amount that they're um, using these information goods, and that might seem intuitively fair, and um, so this is the uh, natural way to coordinate to solve this prisoner's dilemma problem. Um, but Scotchmer then kind of laments this conclusion, say, okay, well, CHIPS is, is useful for this reason, but it also then has the unfortunate consequence that we might have two little public sponsorship. She's primarily talking about spending on uh, grants, but it's also I think, true of um, spending on things like R&D tax incentives, the other things that Danny and I were talking about in our first paper. So we have too little public sponsorship and too much intellectual property, because states are now um, having to have intellectual property laws, and that's where they're going to be focusing on their innovation policy. And so I think it's that um, I, I like this paper because it uh, recognizes that we can't just look at a one country model. We have to think about countries in the context of the world. And it's also a, a thoughtful, nuanced account of the TRIPS agreement. It's not saying, oh, TRIPS is awesome. It's saying it's um, complicated, it's important, but it has costs. So in, in our paper, we have a, a similarly nuanced account. And for those of you who are waiting for the punchline, is this going to be a pro trip story or an anti trip story? Should I agree or not? The, the punchline is it's kind of a mixed story. So collectively quote from both sides before. <laughs> um, but in the paper, we're going through each of these steps and saying that each of these steps is incomplete and then the full story is a little more complicated. So uh, on the first step, is it really true that if we don't have coordination, we're going to have rampant free riding and an um, undersupply of uh, spending on the production of information goods? Well, we, we don't know what the globally optimal amount of spending on R&D is. I don't think anyone knows that. It's certainly true that the governments at all levels are transferring significant rewards to innovators beyond what's required by international agreements. 
Um, we don't have a national agreement saying that everyone has to offer grants, but many countries offer grants, many countries offer R&D tax incentives, and there's billions of dollars of spending on these things, and um, IP laws beyond what is required by international agreements. And so in the, in the first part of our paper, we're thinking about, well, why are countries um, choosing to, to spend on information production beyond what's required by international agreements, even if there's going to be uh, spillovers and, and benefits that they can't internalize. And I think this answer depends both on the, the nature of the information good that you're talking about um, and your, your theory of the state. I, mean, I think that a lot of the uh, conventional literature on this views states as uh, unitary rational actors that are uh, behaving in this prisoner's dilemma situation. And so in our paper, one of the things we're trying to do is bring in some of the literature from the um, international relations and international political economy on what motivates states to act, what um, causes them to make choices like this. So there are kind of four branches of that literature that we're going to uh, that I'll talk about, but it's starting with Institutionalism, which I think most closely maps on to the conventional story. So, institutionalists view states as unitary rational actors who are motivated to increase their um, absolute gains. And I think that even within this story, it, it's not obvious that without coordination, there's going to be a, a um, underspending on the production of information goods. So. One reason is that, as I mentioned, information is heterogeneous. It's heterogeneous in lots of ways, but right now let's talk about one way, which is that the, the way that the benefits and costs of producing any particular information good, um, they vary uh, depending on what we're talking about. And I don't have time now to go into all the details of what I mean by information and information good. I mean, in general, I'm talking about both things that we talk about under patent law and copyright law. These are very different things. And, and there's a lot of differences within each of these areas. But if you just think about how these benefits and costs might be distributed across countries, there's three basic options here. Um, so one is that you might have the, the aggregate benefits of producing the good being greater than the cost. So this is welfare enhancing. We want to be spending as a collective on this good. But the domestic benefits are less than the cost in every country individually. Um, so this is an example where you need to have everyone um, collaborating to be producing the good. No one country will have the incentive to do it individually. There are also maybe goods where the benefits are exceeding, the, the domestic benefits are exceeding the cost in one and only one country. And there might be goods where the, the domestic benefits alone are exceeding the cost in a number of countries. And so I don't know which goods fall in this category, but the kind of thing I'm talking about, if you're thinking about like, medical uh, innovation, so things in the first category would be things like cures for diseases that are relatively rare diseases but have a um, sort of uniformly distributed global burden, things like ALS. Things in the second category might be things like moya moya disease, which primarily affects residents of Japan. Um, and things in this third category, I don't know why this is number 112. Um, <laughs> in the third category are uh, Things like a cure for heart disease, which is one of the leading killers nation uh, worldwide. And depending on which of these categories we're in, we're going to have a very uh, different uh, coordination problem. So this is the classic situation in which we might need something like IP or the TRIPS agreement or some global R&D treaty to get everyone to be contributing. For this second category, there's no coordination challenge. This one country where the benefits are exceeding the cost they have an incentive to produce the good unilaterally, even if the rest of the world doesn't exist. No one else has an incentive. Um, you might think if there's some other countries that are still getting benefits, they might, uh, from a fairness perspective, have to, it might be appropriate for them to contribute in some way. But if you're thinking about from an economic efficiency perspective, it's not the conventional story of having a coordination problem. And this, this third category uh, is different from the conventional prisoner's dilemma story, because here the problem is there's too many countries that individually have incentives. And so if, if the US and Japan and Germany each, um, if they were acting individually, 
have a um, incentive to invest in some project that is likely to lead to a cure for heart disease. Um, in a world where they all know that this exists, they each have an incentive to wait and hope that the other ones will do this because they know that these other countries also have an incentive. Um, and so you can address this kind of problem through uh, IP trips agreements like we have now. You could also, I mean, if, this is more like the, if you're thinking about a game theory perspective, it's more like chicken than a prisoner's dilemma. Um, in the chicken game, the rational strategy is to uh, be the one who throws your steering wheel out the window first and commits to not swerving. And so if you had a, an anti r and treaty, if, if Japan and, uh, and Germany committed to not investing in this, then, then we're back in this situation where the US is going to go forward unilaterally. Um, now again, that from a fairness perspective might, seem, might not seem like the right outcome, but I, I think this highlights a point that we come back to a number of times that uh, the coordination on, on IP treaties often has a more significant impact, we think, on these distributive concerns than on um, the traditional efficiency story. So this is one reason that even if states are rational actors in this institutionalist framework, um, for some kinds of goods, there's not going to be a, a undersupply. Another reason is that uh, states might have positive books local externalities that counter these free riding concerns. Um, so this is similar to the problem of information production at the, um, the, the national level. People like Camilla Hurdy have been thinking about this and races between different regions. We have the same problem, that, or same situation at the global level where states get some benefits from having information production located in them. And in theory, this could lead to overinvestment in the, the total spending of each of these jurisdictions on trying to attract businesses within their borders. Um, and I think this is also analogous to the, the issue of racing by individual firms, where basically any time when you have some profit that multiple parties are able to compete for, you might have a situation where you have uh, too much spending to uh, acquire this. And when you're in a situation where you're concerned about underspending, you can't tell a priori which way this is going to come out. So this was the, the institutionalist framework where we're thinking about the states as, as individual rational actors trying to maximize absolute gains. There are other theories of uh, international relations. And I'm going to go through these more quickly. But um, one of these is actually older than institutionalism. The, realism story, where states are still considered as rational actors, but here they're seeking to maximize relative rather than absolute gains, and, and are primarily concerned about national sovereignty and, um, and security. And so I think a lot of spending on uh, production of information goods can be explained through this story, things like the space race and um, uh, military spending. Another story is uh, the constructivism theory, which thinks about the role of institutions in propagating norms. Um, and I think says that these norms have to be norms of increasing spending on science, but people like Martha Fumor have done work uh, on the role of organizations like UNESCO in uh, convincing developing countries that spending on science is the kind of thing that states do, and, and having them be establishing national science organizations. And I think this theory also can explain some state spending on information goods. And then there's also the, the liberalism um, theories that look below the state at the role of domestic politics within them. And, and so states are not just unitary rational actors who have one goal. They have lots of goals because they have lots of people within the state who have different goals. Um, and so you may have rent seeking by concentrated industry and this, uh, industry groups within a state that then need to um, perhaps over supply of information with this. And so our, our point here is not that we um, don't have a coordination problem or we necessarily have under supply. So we can't conclude a priori that we're, our aggregate investment is going to be suboptimal or super optimal in the absence of coordination. So that's uh, complicating the first step of the three-step 
some of the conventional wisdom I was laying out at the beginning. So it's an unsatisfying story. We don't know what the right answer is there. But assuming that for some kinds of goods, we want to have coordination, um, the second step that I talked about was that IP is the obvious coordination step because we don't have a global public finance system. And um, I think that that can oversimplify the complications of using IP to uh, coordinate spending. Because in, in practice, the, it's not as simple as simply saying, okay, well, every country has to have 20 year patents. Um, there's a lot, the size of the IP transfer from consumers to innovators depends a lot on how the laws are implemented at the domestic level. Um, and there are a lot of benefits from that, but if you're thinking about it from the uh, efficiency perspective of this is how we want states to be coordinating, um, then TRIPS has a, a lot of wiggle room. And I don't think it's obviously easier than coordination on other kinds of um, innovation mechanisms. Uh, there are lots of examples of not as large scale, but other types of uh, coordination on non-IP mechanisms like our science collaborations. Um, the EU's had framework goals to increase R&D spending, there's tax treaties. And so our point here is simply that it's not obviously true that IP is the right answer. And the, the third step was that, well, when states are coordinating on IP, um, under the conventional story, we're going to then have too much IP and too little spending at the um, non-IP at the domestic level. And we think this also isn't entirely right, because global and domestic IP spending are sometimes more separable, um, both in terms of the, how states are choosing to allocate goods at the domestic level and how they're choosing to incentivize goods. So if a state wants to not use price as its allocation mechanism domestically, then it can choose to um, buy IP rights and offer uh, goods through some non-price mechanism. So if you think of like, the way the UK allocates access to pharmaceuticals, this might be an example of that. Um, and states can also have the option of choosing non-IP domestic incentives. Now, TRIP still constrains what their choices are, but they can have um, any incentive that involves innovators opting into that. Um, so this gives them some autonomy in selecting their innovation zones. And we think this is a normative argument in favor of IP coordination in that by having coordination on IP rather than having everyone being required to uh, contribute to a global prize fund, this is allowing countries the autonomy to choose their domestically optimal system. But as a final note, um, this story only works if you have uh, the country convinced so if it's choosing non-IP to allocate goods domestically, they can't think that these is, is going to um, have the international resale market. This people from other countries will benefit from its investment in these goods. Uh, so if you think this story is right, this could be a, another argument in favor of the jazz photo rule, which the Federal Circuit is currently considering whether they want to go forward with. So that's a um, complicated story with a lot of steps and this is new areas for me to be thinking about and so I would love your thoughts on any of this. Um, very cool paper, uh, a small comment and a small question. Uh, the comment is the goods you described as sort of countries producing under realist theories mm -hmm. might not be information goods the way you're talking about them. They might all be the sorts of things that are held as trade secrets. In fact, by definition, you know, if you want to compete in a realist sense, you might want to hold everything as a trade secret. We don't share our military secrets or our space race secrets with other countries so much. Um, and then uh, the small question. Can you go back to the slide where you showed the, I guess it was the slide that had one, one, and two on it. That was maybe the yeah, other memorable thing about it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, so 
I couldn't tell whether you're using a model in which there's basically just a binary decision. Do I invest in research in this uh, intellectual good, or do I not invest, or whether the country is picking the level of investment as well? Because it's certainly true that under you know, um, your second category of things where benefits will cost, exceed costs, you know, somebody will invest, but they might not invest at the socially optimal level if they're not going to reap the benefits of all the, you know, what's, what's valuable about their drug in other countries. So, you know, they might not race as fast, they might not run as good of a trial, they might not put as many people to work on it, et cetera. So I, tell mm -hmm. me about your model of innovation here. Yeah, so, so another thing that I have had to go into here is that another way that things can vary is depending on how, how you think that um, investments in information are aggregated. Um, and so this is assuming um, that there's some talking about some project that has this cost and so we're just making an individual choice. But you're, you're right that uh, there may be situations where you have something like oh, and it's where Japan independently, if it doesn't exist in the TRIPS world, isn't going to invest at the socially optimal level. On, on the first point, I, I think um, it's true that there'll be a sense of towards C2C, but um, I don't think that means that all like the, the U.S. the military agencies are spending a, you know, huge amounts of money to academic researchers, to uh, much of which is then being published. And, and so while there are some information goes, I think it increases spending. Um, yes. Um, so I think this is a great project. Um, so your last point about global and domestic IP policy may be separable. It makes me think the last international IP panel that we talked about the patentable subject matter uh -huh. and how the U.S. legislature courts might be uh, reducing protection, but then the stance the executive branch, right, the U.S. trade representative has taken abroad is that, oh, it's actually uh, very stringent, so you, know, you can't have all these exceptions for patentable subject matter for, you know, for business method patents or computer software, things mm -hmm. like that. And so I think that might be an example of a situation where uh, you know, we're perhaps trying to get stronger rights abroad, but then we want a little bit more flexibility at home to, to kind of balance the various interests. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a, a great point, and I think that also ties into our point about uh, like simply saying, oh, we'll require everyone to have IP is, is too simple a story. There's a lot that varies domestically, and if you just look at the trajectory of patent law in the U.S., the way that that has fluctuated, arguably all within the bounds of trips, um, there could be a huge amount of variation. 